Mendelssohn, you're up. Chag Sameach and good morning. Um, you know, the text that was uh, put into the packet is there as background material for you. Um, I don't want to spend all the time referring to the materials because then we don't have discussion. Essentially, we're looking at, a, a while back, I gave a talk on Judaism being a combination. We are re, a religion, a culture, and a people group, all three. And our history starts with being a peoplehood, an ancient Israelite religion uh, before the destruction of the temples. Uh, this is the beginning of the peoplehood. We had been in the promised land and we were becoming a people rather than just a group of Israelites crossing Midbar. We became B'nai Yisrael, the people of Israel, and finally became Jews when Judah was the dominant tribe. We became Jew, Yehudim. The religion stayed in the, in the hands of the priests. In the beginning of the common era, we had the development of Judaism as a religion observed by all. And then there were communities of Jews within kingdoms. We lived in small areas. There was an interest in practice within those areas. And it was only until the diaspora in Judaism that we started to really see a difference in practice throughout Judaism. Each community up till then would have its own approach dependent upon what the uh, community required. Uh, you know, the, the best example I can give you is uh, during Pesach, do you allow rice at your table or not? It's a party. Rice was the staple. Rice is part of the meal. And during, in the Ashkenazi, uh, regions, potato is a staple, and rice would not be allowed. So, our foods, the way we did things, were largely uh, influenced by where we lived and what the physical constraints were of the area. The movements now were all the way into the Enlightenment period. As we develop movements, we develop different approaches to Judaism as a religion, looking at theology and practice from our approach, how we wish to view what our religion is telling us. And our communities were all over the world. The geographical locations were much larger. Judaism may have been practiced within a city or within a community within a city, but the community was again constrained by the geographical location only because our technology wasn't tremendous. We were, we were really communicating on a daily basis with the people within reach. Once technology takes place, this is where we start to see community change. Community becomes worldwide. And our communities within the world changed. Um, you know, Rabbi DePaulo gave a great talk one time at Heritage Point, talking about the millenniums and how their approach to Judaism is much different than in older generations. This is reflecting a change in the concept of community. That community then, as the article in, in the text that I, that I gave you, is indicating that it's more along the lines of what do we identify with rather than what organization we identify with. I'm giving fast, broad strokes. I want to get to the meat of our discussion. In a half hour, is not a long time. Today's Judaism, we have common values, monotheism, 
justice based on the idea that God is a God of justice. We must be just. Tadaka, Zedek, all of this, this common value of justice drives us. We have a relationship. This, this relationship really is the crux of the conversation. We have a relationship between the individual and the community. We have a responsibility to the community. The community has a responsibility towards them. Our Talmudic laws in the Zikin, Bhattra, Baba Kama, uh, Baba Metzia, basically reflect what we find in Torah. If you look back at Parshat Mishpatim, chapters 21 and 22, it's talking about what happens, how you treat your slave, your servants, what happens if you're in a fight and you strike someone else. But if other damage ensues, the penalty shall be for life, for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. This is the famous idea of understanding that the punishment needs to fit the crime. We continue in the same area. What happens if your ox scores somebody else? What happens if you dig a pit and don't cover it? All of these things are designed to say, what do you do when something happens within your community? That you have to protect those around you and the community has a responsibility to deal with the individual. Now let's look at it. At it us as Jews, again, back from the peoplehood concept, we can look at common characteristics. I would submit that we are all critical thinkers, that we're cynical, we don't take things at face value, we question. In fact, one of the things that I found in the hospitals when I'm talking with doctors and they're trying to understand Jewish patients is, I don't know about you, but when we talk to a doctor, we've got a list of questions. I would, I would guarantee that most of you have gone on the web, looked up the condition, and has a list of questions dealing with medicines, with symptoms, all these questions we're going to ask the doctor to understand what's going on with ourselves. And what's happening is this, these questions are designed to help us understand. They're not challenging the doctor. They're not challenging the expertise. They're for us. And somebody who's not Jewish has to understand that because that's really one of the way, one of the ways that we function that, that some other peoples might not. Okay. I've moved us up till now. And here we have COVID-19. All of a sudden, our community, the way we function, the way we deal with each other, our religious practices, everything changes. This is called Hora'at Sha'ah, a time for unusual step. We've had this historically, by the way. This is not the first time we've had to react to a pandemic. Not the first time we've been in an unusual situation. As recently as the Shoah, we had communities that have had to practice their Judaism differently. So we have these unusual, this unusual system right now going on with COVID-19. What principles do we use? One is Dina the Mahuta Dina. The law of the land is binding upon Jewish community. Excuse me. And that doesn't apply to the creed specifically designed to disrupt Jewish practice. That we will do anyway. But it applies to rules that may have that side effect if they're made by legitimate authorities for the public good. For example, praying as a minion is something we cannot do until our synagogues are reopened. And even then, is that safe? for certain communities. So 
different synagogues have used different methods of dealing with that concept of minyan. Is being on Zoom a minyan? And each different rabbi has to choose what is the right answer for that. Even now, there's a discussion within the conservative movement. You have a minion in one place, 10 adults, 10 Jewish adults within, let's say, a synagogue, a chapel, or, or main sanctuary. It's correctly, can those who are zooming into that minion be considered part of the minion? And that's one of the options that's being uh, promulgated by the conservative movement now. Jews and Jewish institutions must apply with the local ordinances intended to protect the community from COVID-19. That is Dina de Malkuti Dina. But one of the principles that's happened in Jewish law is once there's a change, the change has been made. And is that just for the special situation? Or once you've found a change that works or has caused Judaism to change, now does that change Judaism forever? Is that practice now on the books? It's kind of like a secular law. Once there's a precedent, can you go back to that precedent and apply it to new situations? And Judaism has done that throughout time. So what we are going to be experiencing a new normal, the new normality. And this is the question that I wanted to raise. What is this new normality going to be? What will be our interaction? What will be our dependency upon each other, just like we've had for so many years? I'd like to open it up, if I may, and uh, ask you all to unmute and let's go. This is a free for all. There is no one right answer and there's no expert. Rather, it takes all of us to start to figure out what is that new normality. And I guarantee every rabbi who's on this, uh, this Zoom is going to be listening because this is the material we need to craft our future in our own community. Is there anyone who would like to unmute and start? Uh, instead of unmuting, if you could just please raise your hand and then we'll just uh, work it that way. Okay, Wendy? And then how do we unmute Wendy once? Oh, Got it. I... Okay. So I'm curious, Rabbi, you said uh, hi first, everyone. Um, I'm curious why you're saying that the, if a law is changed, it, ha it, it sticks permanently. Is that just in theory or is that by design? Because certainly the thing that occurs to me is perhaps the fear that the law will stick permanently makes it difficult to put in place a reasonable temporary law. And we've had both situations. There have been times when a law has been temporary and has remained temporary. But usually what happens is once this change has been allowed for a particular situation, there's another situation that's so similar to the original situation that it gets applied and it continues that way. Uh, this is just something that has happened historically and therefore it is a possibility and could be considered a probability. It's something certainly to be considered. Is that stifling, do you think, though, right now? That, that, the, that the risk is... It, it certainly could be. Right now. What, what, what are your opinions? This is not my show. This is yours. This is a community effort. After all, yeah. you're going to help define community. I'm not the guy with the answers. I'm the guy with the question. We have Rabbi Joel Brennan who wanted to add in. Please. Good morning. Hi, now, I think Wendy's got a real point. Um, one of the, uh, there's a saying in Israel, there's nothing so permanent as a temporary solution. And, you know, the idea that you make a change for present circumstances, but it will never go away is, is the fear. 
um, and it will also keep you from actually dealing with the situation uh, in a way that would be more universal or more long lasting or you know more applicable in more areas and things like that. No, it's a genuine uh, fear, but it's also um, you know embedded in the halakha itself that you can't change a halakha unless you have a beit din that's more powerful or more respected than the than the beit din that decided the halakha in the first place. So we're we're kind of stuck here between the proverbial uh, rock and hard place as far as making changes, uh, unless you know you don't particularly subscribe to to the Jewish law to begin with, in which case you know, you're you're going to try and root your decisions in morality that uh, you know that you that you deem correct. So um, you know it kind of is an open-ended question. There's, there's both sides. Uh, we have Andrea Alfie. Um, you know, like I was saying earlier, I think, I think this has given us all like a good perspective into, you know, accessibility has been a big problem within many communities, but the Jewish community where, you know, people of all denominations have said like, the synagogue isn't an accessible place for, you know, people with disabilities and health issues and other other issues. So if we can find a way and we can see a way to let someone be involved in a minion, I mean, I'm really proud that a lot of synagogues have in Orange County have had live streaming before this even happened. So they were, you know, a lot of you were up and ready to go, but are the Torah studies always live streamed? Have they always been live streamed? Is a minion always live? You know, the, the service, you know, the Friday or Saturday service is just one little piece of all the different ways that a synagogue or a temple is important, have all those other pieces been accessible this whole time? And if we do it and we can be open in this moment, why would we want to close and go back and shut that off for people that even when it's healthy and safe to go out, they don't have the ability to go out and participate in that same way. So what Andrea is doing is really taking the concept and giving practical example. Are we going to try and go back or are we going to find this new normality that's more practicable and more practical? Certainly, you're absolutely right. The streaming, the uh, Zoom study sessions, all these different methods have given a broader uh, accessibility to those who have not been able to access before. And it's allowed us to create a larger community than just within our individual synagogues. One of the best examples is uh, tonight and this morning. Our community is Orange County, and we have come together to study together in a way that we've never done before. And it's a wonderful way of doing so. Uh, do we want to go to Lindy first and then Steve, or Steve and then Lindy? Uh, I'm not seeing. Lindy was raising her hand in the in the bot it, at, on okay. her screen. Steve has yeah. his blue hand. Uh, well, going along with uh, the now that we've started doing zooming, and and I know that a lot of I'm I'm in New York right now, and I was in Orange County, and one of the nice things about this horrible situation, or the blessing maybe is that I have now been able to connect back to Torah studies that I was used to be a part of. And now I am, now that they've been moved from Shabbat to Sunday, I am able to be a part of, which is really nice. And with that, I've connected other people, which then means that the group has maybe expanded, but then more understanding, people that didn't understand the Torah are getting, gaining more understanding by being able to connect to other people. And also we've broadened our, you're in Orange County, it's really nice because you're a variety of congregations and if we can continue to do something like that, maybe we can get other congregations or people that are involved and we can begin to understand the differences that we don't necessarily have all those differences and maybe that's a way to unite the Jewish community essentially. Um, at least that's how I've seen it. Plus, I've connected people from all over the world together 
in one microcosm on Zoom studying Torah, which is giving everybody a different perspective from different cultures, which has been a, a very nice thing. And I hate to see that glossed. I really hate to see that lost. So I, I, it's kind of agreeing with Andrea. Thank you. Steve, uh, let's get you unmuted so we can hear what, yes. So I, I think, you know, somebody who's, who's done sort of this thing for a long time, uh, being involved in Musar, I've had Kavruta partners from New York, from uh, Chicago. I've learned with people from Vancouver, from, uh, from Israel. Uh, so that's, that's been an ongoing thing for me. Uh, but now it's becoming something more routine and, and more within the local community. And what I find it's doing is it's, it's, it's dissolving the, the barriers of geography that we've had in the past. And so I've read some things recently about how that's been kind of lamented and there's concern over the fact that, you know, brick and mortar synagogues uh, may be challenged to find people because now the, the, the geographic barriers that kept them in, in a particular community are, are dissolving. Uh, and it's easy for them to go online and join in a community wherever they want to go. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the challenges. And it, it may actually be a challenge in the sense that can we rise to, to meet that, that need and, and provide for what those people are looking for so that they don't have to go looking for some other place to find it. So I, I think it's, it's, it's a challenge to us to offer the best that we possibly can um, and address all those different needs that are out there independent of geography. Thank you. Uh, David. Next Oh, wait, uh, Sue is there first. Oh, I'm sorry, Sue. I didn't do my apology. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Hello? Hi. Yes, uh, this is kind of what's been said before, but I'd like to, to reiterate that uh, this is good in some ways to be able to experience so many different kinds of service and take part in distance learning. I've, uh, I've participated in more things and, and learned more things in the last few months uh, since, since we've not been meeting. And uh, I think this is a great opportunity to, to take part in things without driving a long distance, which is something we're all concerned about for various reasons, including the environment. And uh, well, I, I like the full service synagogue and I hope it certainly continues and it serves many wonderful functions. I'm glad to see that we're doing some things without it. And I think maybe we can start learning to do more things on a more modest level of expenditure and let more people participate without uh, driving or commuting or or uh, or paying for things being as big an issue. I know full service synagogues have been struggling and they're, they're gonna be struggling more, but uh, maybe in the long run we'll be, we'll be doing more things in a more modest way and um, not requiring as much money to, to be Jewishly active and that'll make it easier for more people to participate. Thank you. Um, Eileen, uh, I, I missed you as well, so we'll get Eileen and then David, and then I just have enough time to close it up. Eileen? Wait, am I unmuted? I was going to say my grandfather started, I, I live near Philadelphia, and I'm 70. I grew up near Philadelphia, and there's beautiful synagogues. All the Jews left. The beautiful buildings are still there. And I think the thing is, we have to remember, synagogue is not just the building. It's way more than that. So I just am throwing that out. Thank you. And uh, Dave. Mr. Zarno, unmute. I'm here. Good. Um, Rabbi, thank you. It's so nice to see you. Chag uh, Sameach. I'd like to know uh, what constitutes in this virtual um, 
lifestyle that we're now engaging, what constitutes a kahila, what constitutes a community? And, uh, and then of course the pragmatics are, how about a revenue stream issue with how do we, uh, and, how do, and how do we have common customs? And, uh, and, and so on, and who's the Merida kind of thing? What, what happens to these concepts as we evolve? So I would throw that out as a question. Good question. And this is a perfect way to finish the, the discussion so I can allow the next person to begin on time. We're looking at, and, and the, these last questions are, are perfect because you're right, a synagogue is not just bricks and mortar. It's not the building. A synagogue is this initial, this small community that's coming together to support each other. The functions of a synagogue are not just to teach, as perhaps the education arm needs to be continued in this manner. It's partially for prayer. It traditionally was the uh, communication arm of the community that can be handled electronically as it is now. But we have to find, the, the challenge that we're facing now is finding a way for a, a method of allowing people to pray as a community, which is different than learn from a community, depending on your approach to prayer, your approach to definition of a minion, and how that minion must function. And I fully admit that my definition is different than a lot of the people in this chat room right now. And it has hampered my ability to um, dive in a community right now. And I anticipate down the road, I will be able to dive in a community again and be comfortable with my definition. So community will be finding people with the like definition and bringing them together. Um, the revenue needs to be there so the synagogue function can continue. Having people there for life cycle events, having people there to be the Marda Atra, to offer those answers as communities have the question. But it's going to be something different than what we've had before. Um, the, the Orange County Board of Rabbis has discussed already the, the, the possibility of sharing certain expenses. And all of these questions are, have started and none of us have the answers yet. We're still working down the road trying to find out how our community is evolving, not just after COVID-19, but as we move through the 21st. My time is up. Thank you all. Chag Sameach. Dr. Koach, Rabbi Joe, for leading us on this exploration.